Welcome to the Tournament Poker Edge podcast, brought to you by TournamentPokerEdge.com, the only podcast dedicated exclusively to poker tournament strategy. Now here's your host, Clayton Fletcher. Hello once again, everybody, and welcome to the Tournament Poker Edge podcast. I'm your host, Clayton Fletcher, here in beautiful, sunny, extremely warm Las Vegas, Nevada, where the main event is currently in progress. Um, Yeah, there's a lot going on. It's a big, big, big World Series, breaking lots and lots of records. The main event has the second largest total number of players in it, I think, of all time, which is um, unreal. It is uh, wild being here right now. Um, I wanted to thank you all for your comments on last week's episode and also let you know right now before you stop uh, listening, I have a guest. I pre-recorded an interview with the great Jen Shahadi, who's been on the podcast once before Uh, Back in January, we spoke with her during the Poker Stars Caribbean Adventure, and now I caught up with her again here at the World Series of Poker, and I think uh, she's a great interview. She gives us a lot lot to think about, a lot of food for thought. Um, I want to thank you guys for your comments, your tweets, um, even some of you in person grabbing me here at the World Series to discuss some of the hands that I mentioned um, on the last podcast. And it was interesting to hear everyone's opinions. It seems that the consensus is I should have given up on the ace nine <laughs> at some point. But uh, sometimes I don't, I don't have that give up button uh, to press. Now, I did consider giving up in that spot, but because I was able to put him on pretty much a jack, uh, and I was trying to bluff him off of ace jack, He ended up calling me with Queen Jack, so maybe you guys are right. Just he has to have bluff catchers in his range, and all the jacks are going to call me. Even though he took forever to do so, he did come up with the right play. Um, And many of you felt that I would not play aces or kings in that way. Um, You guys are wrong. I definitely do a lot of uh, checking with over pairs. especially versus aggressive opponents like the one in last week's episode. So anyway, just in case anyone's listening to this who has not listened to that, I don't want to belabor talking about hands that we haven't discussed yet on this episode. And so without further ado, I want to take you directly to my incredible interview with the amazing Jennifer Shahadi. My guest this week is a repeat customer here at the TPE podcast, um, we interviewed her back in January when we were both participating in the Poker Stars Caribbean Adventure. Uh, she is a respected poker player. She is the Mind Sports Ambassador for Poker Stars and one of my favorite human beings. Welcome back to the show, Jen Shahadi. Hello, Clayton. Thank you very much. Thanks for being here. Uh, How has your summer been? Talk to us about the World Series 2019. Well, I came in for the main event, and unfortunately I busted. But, um, yeah, I'm always happy to be out in Vegas. Some of my favorite people are here, and the main event is such a special opportunity that even when you bust, you got to feel grateful. Yeah, just the the privilege of being able to play in such an incredible event that so many people care about in poker is, is unusual. And even though it's disappointing to bust, I really do feel that some of the greatest minds are here playing the main event. And I really always feel inspired afterwards to, you know, think more deeply, think about this tournament and kind of how the the different ways that people approach it also are indicative of leaks that they might have in everyday life or in other poker tournaments. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Talk, talk to me about that. Like, what kind of leaks do you notice? Well, I think there's this, uh, even very, very strong players approach the main event with this idea that it's more important than any other tournament, which might be true. But I think that the emotions that come into the game are sometimes overwrought in the main event. 
So if you're if you're approaching a tournament feeling like, oh, this is the one that counts, this one matters more than all the others, what kind of mistakes do you think most players make because of that flawed mindset? I think because we're so automated in many ways, pre-flop decisions, I think that they, the problem is they match up um, the same kind of aggressive range as pre-flop that they're used to with um, not enough aggression on future streets and that this is kind of like a terrible combination because you actually get lots of money in, but then you're not as aggressive as the hand progresses. So it's like almost like it would be better to flat more hands if you knew that about yourself. So I feel like sometimes people maybe aren't introspective enough about how they're going to act. Like, you have to pick. I think coupling uh, a very aggressive style preflop with not enough aggression on the turn in river is going to result in really bad results. Yeah, for sure. Did you notice that as well? I have noticed that as well, yeah. Um, I think the easiest part of the game is preflop, right? I mean, you only have two cards, we don't really know like so much of the of the flow of the hand can change on the flop of course like that's kind of the defining moment of any hand to me is the flop so you're in the pre-flop mode and you're playing on autopilot because you know you know from all of your work with mathematical problem solvers and such that uh you know you should open these hands from this position and those hands from that position and all that and then you know, no one has gotten, maybe Isaac Haxton, but very few people have gotten like into exactly how to play each and every flop on every single situation. So, yeah, I feel like people know how to play before the flop. And then because maybe in the back of their minds, they're like, oh, I don't want to screw this up. And now the pot's inflated. This is the most important tournament in the world. Maybe they, they end up being too passive. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's only ICAX, and I do think there's a lot of players now who are just, you know, going over various flops in their databases and, like, trying to memorize different strategies. But a lot of times there are mixed strategies, so you can choose usually a more passive or aggressive route, and maybe people are over-choosing the passive route. And the reason I came to this conclusion was not only from my own observation, because, of course, there's hundreds of tables and I'm only at one, but also just by looking at the percentage of players that remain after each day. Um, to make myself feel better about busting. I did bust on day two, though. But if you look at the number of players who bust on day one and the SPRs that you see even as early as level one, it actually seems like a big mismatch. Like, there should be way more players eliminated based on the SPR. Like, uh, for instance, like, a typical hand, even in, like, level two, would be, like, open to... Level level two was, like, 153. Or not, not 150. I mean, it was, it's like, 200, 200 300, because yeah. there's no green chips. Right, no 50. But it was 200, 300. <laughs> yeah. So a typical level would be, like, open 800, somebody flats 800, and let's say the small blind squeezes. I mean, the squeeze size in, were sometimes enormous. So somebody might squeeze to, like, 5K, mm -hmm. right? And so then if somebody flats... And, you know, you're going to get squeezed there a lot. Late position open, squeeze from the small line. Um, now the pot is like 12K. And, like, suppose you started the day with 60, but maybe you lost one small pot. Now you've got an SPR of just, like, five or less. Less, yeah. And you're in level one or two. Right. So thinking about that and seeing all of these pots happen, that would be massive flops. And then seeing how many actually got all in by the river. I was like, this... There's a mismatch here. Okay, so everybody's comfortable, like, oh, I should three bet here, I should squeeze here, and maybe the mistake they're making is going a little too big in their sizing or something, and then shutting down. Like, kind of like they took the foot off the gas because they don't want to make a big mistake in the most important tournament in the history of the world. Yeah, I mean, they don't want to lose the first day or something. Yeah, I don't know, but, I mean, it's maybe it's like, it's probably a combination of under-bluffing, not value betting enough, and also... Maybe it's also a combination of the, when they do go for three, their opponents make up a lot of hero folds. Mm -hmm. So it's like, I think it's, it's just like everything together. Yeah. More more folding, less value bet, less bluffing means that, um, like I, I put a poll on Twitter and I asked some high rollers about it as well. And it seems like the general consensus is that if people played a more optimal strategy, maybe there would be like 50% people left at the day. Instead of yeah. 72, right, right. 75. Yeah. So that's like a big difference. It is. I, and, you know, I know from when I first started playing, now this is my 12th main event. Not my, I mean, not, not my 12th main event, but my 12th World Series of Poker. I didn't play the main event every year, especially in the beginning. I didn't have anywhere near the bankroll I would have needed. But I've been coming out here for quite a while. 
I have noticed that even for myself in the first couple of years, like making day two somehow felt like the first step that I wanted to take. Like it was very important to me that I made it to day two, even though the money doesn't even happen until day three. Now day four. Yeah, day four, but yeah, but in the early years, it would be day like late day two, early day three. Um, and now it's all the way up to day four, I guess. Yeah, we won't reach the money tomorrow. Uh, as we're recording this, it's actually day two C. Um, and I'll be playing day three tomorrow, Monday, July 8th. So we're recording July 7th. Um, yeah, I, for me, it was important that I make day two. I wanted to kind of be able to tell my friends and family like, oh, I, I did well, I made it to day two. You know, you don't want to go home because people, that's a question you get asked a lot when you tell people that you play poker. They'll be, oh, have you ever played the main event? I'm like, yeah, I played. And they'll be like, oh, did you make, how far did you get? Did you get to day two, to day three? This is what people, even casual, like very casual, like tertiary, it's like barely know anything about poker. They understand there's a day one. And if you do okay on that, you can make day two, even though there's no prize for day two. It was something that was in my head as, you know, a goal. And I and I think about that, and it, there's some validity to it. It matters what other people think in life, and so in a lot of cases. But and that's that's the thing when you see a huge portion of people doing something, instead of saying like, "Oh, they're all idiots," I like to think, "Well, why?" Because there's value in your family supporting you in poker, and the people that only support you once a year because you know they know about the World Series. Because it's on TV. Yeah, there is some value. So if you're in a situation where you're like, this is a really close spot, and the solver says, I could barrel off here, or I could just like take the more passive route and go for my, you know, my showdown value, which I have, like maybe you're just more inclined to go for the the, uh, latter strategy, knowing that there are these like external forces. But of course, the other side of that is that you're then practicing bad habits. And so I, I find it to be like a really fascinating issue. And I'm like wondering like, oh, well, what other situations does this come up with in life? You know, where the ideas and visions of other people are dictating how you do things. So interesting. Yeah, I wonder about that myself because everybody says, oh, I don't care what other people think. And nobody actually feels that way. Of course we care what other people think. Even the person that is so adamant about how he or she doesn't care about how other people think, that person probably cares even more. Well, I, one thing I tried to do um, with this main was I tried not to ask people how many chips they had. Because I feel like that's like, we need to change the culture a little bit if we want people to play the main event better. I mean, I don't care if people don't play, but I feel like we are in, as like a... We're, if we want to like progress in like development of poker, the it's like obsession with like how many chips people have at different stages of the tournament. It's like so insane, especially like on day one, yeah. and like asking your friends about it and stuff. Like who cares? I was yeah. like, I was gonna write something like, every time I ask you what your main main event chip um, stack is, I owe another fifty dollars to charity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I think maybe a better question, especially in the case of day one, would be, did you bag? You know, yeah. are you are you still in the tournament? You know, uh, for those who don't know, at the end of the tournament, you put all of your chips into a bag, and then that bag is placed on your next table for the next day when you come back. So, I, I, I don't have a problem with people asking me, "Did you bag?" But yeah, certainly after day one, it really doesn't matter if I made it to day two with a small stack or a medium stack or an average stack. It's so early at that point; it it really doesn't matter. I mean, of course, you want to bag the chip lead. Everybody wants to bag the chip lead, but. It's kind of irrelevant. You know, the stats of how often the day one chip leader even ends up cashing are kind of astonishing. Oh, Uh, yeah, because there's so many waves in poker. Absolutely. And I think that's like part of it. You have to get used to those waves. And in tournaments like this, it is the most difficult to remain professional at all times. It's not easy at all. And so, yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a fascinating tournament, and I just think we're really lucky to get to play in the VTR. We are. Now, in terms of remaining professional, have you ever found yourself in a situation where you felt like it was challenging to remain professional, maybe just due to the magnitude of the moment or other factors in the main event? Oh, yeah. I mean, I feel like they have, you know, there's the whole concept of, like, chirping chips about how, like, when you're, <laughs> when you're winning pots and you have a lot of chips, you're, like, social and want to talk to the table, and then when you, like 
lost a pot or you have a short stack, you're like just like kind of frustrated and embarrassed, even though, of course, you could have played perfectly. Right. I do think there's that element where like you, it's you want your it's people respond to you um, better, even socially when you have more chips, which, again, is a microcosm of the world at large where people are like potentially nicer to rich people. Yeah. And or people who have more. If you walk up in an expensive looking suit, you're liable to get better service in a restaurant or what have you. Like the examples are infinite, right? And the same in poker. I've noticed that when I'm winning, uh, people are quicker to tell me they recognize me. Uh-huh. Um, they ask me about comedy. Um, they want to like be friends with me, right? And when I'm losing, when my stack is short, uh, they tend to not want to joke around with me, even though I try to keep kind of the same spirit, even when the chips are down. Uh, I've I've noticed that it's harder for me to kind of get the table going yes. when I'm losing. So again, it's like it's kind of like a give and take. It's not just in your head. Like you are um, you are getting received differently based on what you have. And yeah, it's just, it's crazy how poker is just such, such a great metaphor for for life and business and like finance in so many ways. Absolutely. Um, I know you don't have a ton of time for me today, so I wanted to make sure that we uh, first. I want to tell people about your podcast. So. It's called The Grid, right? Yes, and I've already booked Clayton for an episode. The Grid is a concept that um, really is very meaningful to me. It's a podcast that my husband produced, Daniel Marum, and what we're doing is we're doing a 169-episode podcast, so each podcast is another cell on The Grid. So if you use solvers or even just like, you know, something like poker stove, um, you know that there's a, a visual depiction of hands that looks like a grid, kind of like a chessboard, which was my first love. And it's kind of beautiful, all those little squares, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And the idea is that I'm getting a different player to come in and to talk about every single hand on the grid from three deuce off to pocket aces. And I've reserved King Jack. King Jack off. For a very important hand that I played and I don't even remember what tournament, but I have it all written down somewhere. But I played a hand with King Jack that I will probably never forget in my life. And I'm not going to talk about it on this podcast because I want you to have exclusive rights to my King Jack offsuit hand. So everybody check out Jen's podcast, The Grid. I'm sure it's on iTunes and Stitcher and everywhere else people find. It is in all of the yeah. it is in all of the different <laughs> networks. Absolutely. The usual places. Thank yeah. you, yes. So with the time we have remaining, I was wondering if you might have any hands from the main event that we could discuss. I know you already told us that you did bust before day three. But um, do you have anything that you wanted to uh, run by me? Well, there was one funny psychological um, element, which was just a really weird story, which, by the way, is usually the type of hand I want in the grid. Not just, like, good strategy, but also, like, something funny happens. So in this case, Jack Sinclair, who's a really great player, opens the cutoff. And the button, who is a recreational player, who has been flatting a fair amount, um, seems... Uh, like he he knows what to do, but he's not super active, right? Right. Um, I I three bet the small blind, and I make it a pretty big sizing. It goes twenty three twenty three. I make it nine k. And what level was this? Again? Um, this would have been if if they were opening to twenty three. I think this would have been the one k level. Yeah. Okay, so blinds are five hundred, one thousand with one thousand big blind ante. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And then I. Uh, I made a nine k. I have um, I have one twenty behind. Okay. Um, so Jack you... has a lot, or about the same as me, maybe a little more than me. Um, and uh, anyway, the, uh, the the interesting part of the hand starts now, where the big blind is immediately very interested in the hand, and he's like sitting there thinking for quite a while. Um, actually, cuts out a four bet. I see him, like, take his orange chips out and, like, cut out a four bet. How big was that four bet? Do you remember? I think it was going to – I think it was, like, something like – he cut out, like, six six oranges. Okay. So, so to, like, 30, 30 yeah. 30, that would be a big four bet. If you yeah. Missed, yeah. And then he changes his mind and eventually just uh, flats the the three bet. Okay. So now when you saw him cut out this extra 30,000 and then just call the 9,000, did you think that he was doing that to kind of try to – convince you that you should slow it down a little bit uh, or did you feel like th- there was any angle on his part or do you think that he was honestly considering raising to 30,000 and let you know that he was considering and then decided to just call instead 
Well, the thing about this spot is it almost doesn't matter that much because just V pipping the hand or putting chips in the pot, you probably have a really strong range here. Like, I mean, I, I think it's almost like if he makes it 30K is obviously a very big size, but suppose he makes it like 24K or 23K. It's like he changes his mind, he takes one out. Uh, it's like he basically has the same type of hands that I think he has when he flats the four bet. I Which mean, is what? So what sort of like, range would you put this like, player on? You know, on? tens, ten, nines plus, ace queen suited plus. Yeah, I don't even know if nines would even think about four betting. Well, yeah, but some people might want to just like four bet to, um, to because, fold. because of the dynamics yeah. and because it's, a it's a good hand and because of the dynamics of. Um, you know, jack opening a lot, the button flatting a lot, me, I had squeezed uh, in almost the exact same setup, like an orbit before. Or oh, yeah, that's, before. Im- that's important information. Yeah, yeah. So he's already heard this song once. And maybe he's like, maybe I should take over here. Yeah. Or just go with the cold four from the big blind. That's always sexy. Yeah, yeah, because, you know, with the, non, with the, the you know, you're not closing the action. I mean, it's pretty risky to just, like, flat it. So I feel like, you know, a lot of the same hands that might flat might consider four bending. So I didn't really make too much of it yet. But the one thing that did occur to me was that he could have... Um, I certainly felt like he could have aces or kings. He could be totally bladed. Um, when he cut out the four bet, I did that did occur to me. Okay. Yeah. Cool. And so, well, of course, they could always be bladed, whether they four bet or flat. Bat. Naturally, yeah. I mean, there's so much action already. But maybe the fact that, like, you know, he seemed like more comfortable to kind of like expose what he's doing. I feel like when somebody has aces, they, you know, it doesn't matter what you do because it's very profitable. Right. So, like, if you give away some amount of information, it might, like, some people might let their guard down a little bit. Yeah, and that's obviously, like so many things in this game, that's player dependent. Um, but I, it could be the opposite. It could be the exact yeah. opposite. Yeah, It true. could be that when they have aces, they're more aware of not giving anything away. And like, oh, yeah, oh yeah. I have aces. I better not let anyone see my little twitch in my eyelid. You know, that, that happens a lot, too. So uh, kind of depending on, you know, how much time you spent with your opponent, how much you can read into it. But I tend to agree that he should be flatting with a lot of his monsters here. Yeah, uh, I agree. Yeah. I told. I, th- I think that would be that would be a nice play. Yeah, uh, and, and then I would assume Jack comes along as well. No, he didn't. Black Jack folded pretty quickly, as did uh, the bottom. Okay, now for me in Jack's shoes, I think even if I kind of opened with a, a, a wide range here, um, you know, you mentioned that he has like one hundred twenty thousand. He's already put in twenty three hundred. There's already twenty thousand in the pot. I mean, 24,000 in this pot. I, I think it's a ridiculous fold in his shoes, even if he has nothing. He's in position. He's getting a price. And this button player that you described sounds like he's never going to fold if Jack calls. So we're going to play a big pot now. I mean, you already set this up. I think in Jack's shoes, I can't name a hand that I would fold. Really? I would yeah. I mean, we'll think about some of the worst unsuited hands that you opened from the cutoff. I mean, what are the worst unsuited hands I'm opening from the cutoff when Ace you're. Ace eight off? Yeah, I, I mean, have to ace call. five off. He's priced into call. Oh God, no! I no. know. Yeah, I mean, we disagree, but <laughs> yeah, especially when the button's going to come along. Well, he might not. I mean, he why wouldn't not. he? Why wouldn't he? Uh, three people put in nine thousand. I only have to put in another sixty-seven hundred, and now there's already thirty thousand in the pot. I mean, it would just be to me for Jack to fold there and for the button to fold there. Uh, they they should have never been involved in this pot in the first place. Ace eight is a call. Trust me. <laughs> anyway, we're not going to argue about that because we just don't have time. Um, I mean, I wouldn't be happy about it, but you know, this game is about math, and the pot is offering him such. No, a No, I hear you. I hear you. I just didn't particularly like that kind of like ace eight or you know king nine type hand. It's just uh, playing so badly. I don't think I, I don't think he should be opening king nine from the cutoff. No, I don't mm. think he should. Not when you're in the small blind. Well, but remember, the button is a recreational player, and the big blind is as well. So, but anyway, yeah. um, he, he folded. Let's just give him king nine. Okay, all right. Because <laughs> yeah. I found a, a hand right. that you agree should nine. Fall on. No, I probably would have called with that too, to be honest. I mean, but uh, anything can happen on the flop. Always remember that. And when you get in that kind of price, you have to see the flop. It's just not okay. Not if he starts the hand with like fifty thousand. Okay, all right. If he's got like twenty big blinds or forty big blinds, you guys are deep. Like he can play, he can call this. So, I don't know. He's got and 120 big blinds. You're asking him to put in nine of them. No, I get it. But you have to remember with pot odds that it's also about the percentage you're going to win the pot. And when you have two opponents or potentially three, it's like... Right. It's probably hard. three. I would say probably three. Yeah, it's hard. You know, you have to win it a lot. So, anyway, uh, he... Uh, 
he folded as did the button and the flop was king five five with two clubs I do not have a club in my hand and we again have ace king I don't even know if we mentioned well, I don't that think before. we mentioned it yeah, I have okay. ace king yeah did you not want to mention it because I can take it out no 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 okay. no, 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 no right. it's fine it's fine All right. um, I have ace king and no club I I check and you're heads up now I'm heads up with okay the, the so blind. you're out of position heads up with ace king with the other blind uh-huh. the guy who cut out 30,000 and then decided to just call you um, yeah, exactly, right, right. exactly. Okay, all right. Yeah, yeah. So just to set it up, king, five, five, two clubs, we don't have a club, and you were the last aggressor pre-flop. Do we C-bet this flop? Before you tell me what you did, uh, I can make a case for C-betting the flop. I think that if he called pre-flop with, like, jacks or tens, like, kind of the hands that we think he probably has a lot, um, you might get one more street of value from those hands before he finally gives up on it. Especially if you down bet a little bit. Uh-huh. Like, you know, there's, what, 24000 in this pot or something. If you bet, like, 7000 or something, like, you'll get a call when he has, like, nines plus. And, you know, you're, you're doing great against his calling range when you down bet the flop. However, I think there's a strong case to be made for checking because this is one of the best possible flops for your hand. And there's a, there's a lot of value in keeping the pot small and giving him an opportunity to try to steal it. So I think in balance, I'd be about 50-50 between betting and, and checking. Uh, kind of depending on what mistakes this amateur player makes would, would be the deciding factor for me. So is he more likely to bluff you if you check or is he more likely to pay off when he's beat? That is a, that's a tough one. And I agree with you that down betting is de- definitely like a decent play here. I, I think in the hand, I felt like my range is I thought that both plays were reasonable but like I, I defaulted towards checking just because I think my range is weaker than his because you know I'm squeezing with a lot of hands that I just want to play because there's potential dead money in the pot with the butt in there so whereas like he's not like I mean I, I can have like king queen off you know king jack off I could have all sorts of hands suited aces that I don't really want to flat and play four ways out of position I could just have so many hands, whereas he cannot have hands like that. Like he's he's probably not just like like flatting with king queen off or something. So if we boil so. this down, Jen, pre flop, once he calls, uh-huh. he has a stronger range than you. Oh God, yes. He has a I range advantage right. because, like you said, like a lot of us with three bet, especially Jack Sinclair, he opens a lot of hands. Uh, and then with the button flatting, the button too, flat, I mean, it's such a sweet spot for yeah. you. you know, mm-hmm. I mean, I would three bet a lot of hands there. Yeah. So you don't need to have Ace King to put in nine thousand. No, no. Right. I think and like I did the revolution, the orbit before, and they both folded, and I don't even remember what I had, but probably I think it was like a suited Ace or something. So like like a suited wheel Ace. Yeah. So you're so. really wide in your three betting here, as you should be, and then. But he can't be that wide in his call. We already gave him a very tight calling range. So when he puts in the 9K, he's got a range advantage. Therefore, it might be good to check all your hands. Oh, yeah, absolutely, in theory. But you bring up a good point that this, you know, is the main event against an amateur player. So it's like, what mistake is he more likely to make? Isn't but it? it's kind of like when I feel like both are good, both checking and betting, and then I know in theory that checking is potentially the best play, then maybe I'll just default to that. Because, yeah. Because, you know, if I don't think that it's a great exploit to bet, then checking is what I checking is what I did. And this is where the hand got kind of interesting because – Obviously, like, I feel like I have the nuts now. Like, I mean, of course you could have kings or aces. Or you could have my hand. Like, but, you know, still, I, I got what I wanted. Yeah. King what's five, in this, five. What's in this pot? 24,000? Am I close? Um, 23, 23, 9, 9. Yeah, yeah, like 22,000. Somewhere around there. 24, 23, 23, yeah, 24,000. Yeah, let's call it 23. So, yeah. 23,000 in the pot. And then he makes, he, uh, he flicks three chips into the pot. And when he does that, he says, oops. Oh, oops. Yes. <laughs> and so, did you think that he really made a mistake? Well, but here's the thing about the chip. So <laughs> you said that the pot was 23,000. So three orange chips, each orange chip in the main event is 5K. And that's a so, reasonable bet. So 15,000 and 23,000. I mean, in this in this three bet pot, it's, it's potentially a little bit big, but it may, it's not. It's like uh, makes some sense. He's yeah. trying to like maybe jam the, the, uh, the turn. What, what kind of stack does he have again? Um, he has a tiny bit less than me, so he has like 110. Okay. So yeah, if he if he's making it, um, f- no, actually, if he's making it 50 on the flop, it's going to be a three straight game. It's okay. I. What happened was though, he had put in 
a green chip as well. And the greens are worth twenty five thousand each. Exactly. So he's bet thirty five thousand and then said oops immediately. So this is like a one point six X pot bet. And now we have to figure out whether this oops is legit. All right. Exactly. Oh, I love this psychological warfare here. Okay. So he does that and then right away says oops, right? There was no time after he bet before he said oops. It was like a second. I mean, it almost felt like he was saying oops as he was dropping the okay. chips in the pot so that if he had had his wits about him, he could have said 15,000. Right. But like the oops just like came out right instead. There. Okay. Well, so, I mean. Yeah. What do you make of that? Well, at the time, I mean, I've this hasn't happened. I, I mean, I've had people misclick before, but for them, somebody to actually audibly say oops, I just kind of assumed, even though he had done nothing untoward at the table, and he was seemed like a very nice person. I just kind of assumed immediately, like he's probably angling. Okay. Now, do you think this <laughs> angle would be in the category of unethical, or ethical, or or impartial? Uh, that's a tricky one because it can backfire. Uh, I would I would say it's like it's that's why we call it angling because it's right on that borderline where it's not cheating, but it's not completely fair play either. It's like right on that border where you're not going to get eliminated for it. But it's not something that will make you friends in the poker world. Have you ever done anything like that yourself? Or would you ever do anything like that? I've never done anything like that, no. I mean, it's not my style. I mean, come from the world of chess. Uh, Where kind of integrity is important? Yeah, I mean, maybe if it was like against... I'm trying to think if like there was like some situation you're asking me if I would ever do that. Well, maybe there that's, was... a too, that's too wide of a, of yeah. a, of a brush there. Like, yeah. You know, let's just say if if you did that, then you would be you would you wouldn't feel good because even if it worked, it's kind of cheap, right? Well, let's just say what what happens if you did it? Like, look, okay, suppose you did that, and I I did it accidentally, and. That I turned red or something. I didn't say oops, but I turned red. And then um, somehow I actually did hit the turn. Uh, I'm trying to think of an example of like where I did it by accident, but then I used the fact that I did it by accident later in the hand to win a big pot. Right. Like I can imagine doing that. Yeah. Because like, I mean, you just have to deal with whatever situation is. Yeah. We've all know? misclicked. Like sometimes you yeah. grab a 5,000 chip when you meant to grab a 500. Like, we've all done that at some point and most players won't admit that they've done it, but I'll admit that I've made this type of mistake myself before. Um, when I realize I've made the mistake though, I've never said oops. <laughs> so I was thinking like my confidence I mean my confidence that it was an angle was like this is where it's weird because you have to use kind of like gorilla math um, with this concept in, in Dara's uh, satellite strategy book to kind of like decide what to do um, and if I and if I do that it's a pretty easy decision like okay 60% of the time this is an angle 40% it's just an honest mistake which means that like I have ace king obviously I'm calling the bet because Raising doesn't make a lot of sense because if it is a mistake and he's not bladed, um, maybe he'll bluff the turn or something, right? So, so I think that the uh, the decision is pretty clear. And, like obviously, if you have a hundred percent confidence he's angling you, even then I'm not sure you can fold Ace King because he could be angling with the same hand, right? He could have Ace King himself. He could, but he can't love it. He, I mean, he likes it with Ace King, but I don't think Ace King is strong enough to like oops and pretend to have meant to bet 15 like i don't know ace king like i would want to have the nuts like fives or king king right right or yeah. even aces yeah like yeah maybe aces you could yeah. do that yeah but I, I think the oops thing and i would say the percentage probability that he's angling is much higher than 60 here like you don't say oops when you make a mistake. Okay. Well, about. I'm glad you say that. I mean, I just made up 60 as like a ballpark at the time. I felt like it was, probably felt it was a little higher, but yeah. I mean, I definitely didn't think it was a hundred percent. It's never a hundred percent. No. But it's just so it, like look at the parlay here. It's like not only does this guy accidentally grab the wrong chip, but then immediately says oops. And you said he could have even said the right number instead of oops because that's how the timing worked out. If he had his wits about him, which maybe he didn't. I would say I would be – I wasn't there. I wasn't at your table. I've never seen this player. I don't know anything. But just based on what you're describing, I know every time I've ever misclicked, I tried to play it off like I meant to do that. You shut down and don't say a You don't say a thing like, God, I hope nobody noticed yeah. that I just bet 5000 when I meant to bet 500 or whatever it is. 
Um, just play it cool. Maybe they'll think I'm angling and they'll fold because now I'm so stupid because I just put in so much more than I wanted to or whatever. You know, like you don't call attention to it and say, oops. So, yeah, we can't say 100. I would put it around 90 percent. Oh, my God. Well, yeah. then then the turn was a. Uh, oh, so you. I call the 35. Call the 35. Yeah, okay. call the 35. And then the, the turn was an offsuit, six. And I check again. And at this point, he has he has about pop behind because it's like, what is it? Or the 35 of the flop. Um, that's, yeah, 70 plus the 23, 93. Yeah, so he's, he's, got, he's got about, you know, another 75 behind. And he pretty quickly jams. <sighs> and I'm sitting there. And I'm going to have, like, 5K left if I call. And so I, I'm sitting there thinking, like, I'm getting – I'm feeling, like, almost embarrassed because I feel like because I am a very theoretical player, I'm, like, I almost immediately know, like, I don't have it in my in myself to call – to fold. Yeah. But I know, like, when I call and I tell my friends a story, they're going to be, like, well, yeah. I mean – He's he got it. He was angling you, you He's know? He's got it every time. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> honestly – like, if if I think there's a 90% chance that I'm being angled and I know that I'm never being angled or almost never being angled by the same hand that I have or any other hand that I can beat, I honestly think that given that read and because I'm not such a uh, mathematically based player, I mean, of course I know the math, but I'm, I definitely go much more with like what's happening in, in real life, in real time. I hate to say it, but I think I would have folded that flop. Like what's he saying oops with? He's got the nuts. It sucks to like flop king five five with ace king and check fold, but I think that when I have a strong read on somebody like that, and again I wasn't there, so it's not the same as you sitting there. But if you felt pretty sure you're being angled, I think the play is to just lay down your stupid ace king as much as it hurts. Well, I did a uh, I did call yeah, and I thought for a little while, and I was like really I was like a little shaken up because I was like, man, I'm been. Potentially be out of the main event, but I, you know, what really made me call was oh, that, this is your bust out here. No, no, no. Oh, it's not okay. Um, I, what really made me call is I did feel that there was a chance he was doing it with Ace Gang. I okay. There was a chance. Yeah, because that, that's a hand that makes sense to want to to want to cut out a huge four band and then change your mind and just call. Like can kind of add it up, and obviously Ace King is more more common than having aces or kings. So the whole thing added up to me that he could have my same hand and. So I, I made the call, and he turns over jacks. So weird. So maybe it was an oops. <laughs> it was. It, it was. was an it actual was. oops. But then the funny thing is that he decided to combine the oops with an all-in on the turn where he should clearly just check back. Yeah, what's he doing with jacks there? Yeah, and that's why you that's why you really can't fold too much against amateur opponents. So what happened was he was trying... To, so I don't think his, his initial play was an angling, but then he realized that it might be interpreted as an angle. So then he used that information to jam the turn, thinking that I might overfold because <sighs> this I'm terrified. This is such a great hand. I, I love this hand. I love this hand. I'm so glad you brought this hand because there is so much to try to figure out about it. I mean, did you, did you, really, did you at any point consider folding on the flop? Or was it no, just like, no, 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 no. I'm I, too I, close to the top of my range. I, I have a bluff catcher, yeah. whatever, yeah. I didn't consider pulling a flop because I, but then once he jammed the turn, I thought that coupled with the potential angle on the flop and the oops was just really suspicious. The problem like, is once you've, once you already put in the 35, yeah. you can't fold a turn. Yeah, the, the, the decision is really on the flop for me. Well, I guess there could be a club on the turn and maybe. Maybe, but even then, like, you've got so much in already. Yeah, it's not yeah. that much more to call. But uh, he, uh, yeah, you're right. I mean, so I, um, so I felt, I felt like uh, it was really interesting because when I think about the hand, I actually feel like obviously he made a horrible misclick and also just a terrible, I think a pretty bad bet. Like, if you're going to bet Jax there, just bet really small or something. Yeah, it's too big a bet for Jax. Even 15K 15 is way too been, big. Yeah, and obviously yeah. 35 is ridiculous, but... 15, uh, yeah, I agree. Like, I was talking about down betting, even if we bet a hand as strong as ace king. So, obviously, if you check and he wants, you know, if he wants to try to push you off of your, as we mentioned, your your range is much wider yeah. than his. I mean, he could even probably get some value for jacks against worse. Yeah, against like ace queen. Yeah, tens, and you nines. might call if oh, you yeah. bet small enough. Small, sure. With this, this pot size, you might have to call. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I, I don't like his sizing in the misclicked version and the correctly clicked version. <laughs> But it's incredible to me that uh, he would say oops. But then once he does bet 35K with the oops, I feel like I actually kind of like his turn jam. 
Because, well, yeah, because... I, he can get me to fold like King Queen. Like, I think I, w- I would have folded King Queen. Yeah. You know, because I would have squeezed King Queen Of pretty, course you would. And, and then, then I probably would've... checked it. Yeah. And you have to call the overbet on the flop, I guess. I, if, I unless, probably would have, yeah. Unless you can put him on and oops, you know, yeah. whatever. That's yeah. the thing. I might have folded either flop or turn with something like King Queen. Right. Exactly, because, because of all the elements at play. Yeah, but the pot size <laughs> bet offers you two to one. And is King Queen good a third of the time? I mean, that's one way to look at it. Of course, you also have to think about your tournament life and the value of surviving longer and all that. But, you know, just from a chip EV standpoint, if he bets pot on the turn, I think I would have. I think I would have folded the king-queen because I was really not happy with the ace-king. And king-queen is so much worse than ace-king. It really ace is because, because he has ace-king yeah, in his range. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So I think I would have folded. So that was a very amusing hand. And, of course, the table was, like, making fun of him. But I felt like, given the mistake, I actually... And that's the thing about amateur these amateur players that, like... A lot of them are at the World Series of Poker Main event for a reason. They have really good instincts. And I think given the misclick, I kind of like his turn jam in a lot of ways. Because, you know, um, he's going to get me off better. King yeah. Queens, King Queen, you know. Oh, of course, um, yeah. Once he makes that mistake, I think shoving the turn is probably good. Or at least close to break even. Yeah, I mean... It's... But when you call that 35 on the flop, you've got something. The worst hand you have is king-queen. Yeah, yeah that's a problem. That's the problem for him is he can't really get you off of any hand other than king-queen. I mean, maybe queens, you know. That's You're not a... calling 35 with queens. Unless I think it's a mistake. Yeah, which yeah. you didn't. You were pretty yeah, sure. You put he... it at 60%. To me, just the fact that he called attention to it made it seem like he wanted you to see it. It yeah. seemed like an angle, especially the way you described it, like how he could have said the right number instead of oops, almost, like at the same timing. Oh, see, this is why it's a people game. You can you can play with Pio Solver as much as you like, and you should, and we all should, because it's very important to understand the mathematics of the game. Otherwise, you don't even know what you're deviating from, and you're just out there playing in the wind like, like a kite, like flopping around in the breeze. You don't really know what you're doing. The understanding the math of the game and the theory behind the cards is absolutely essential to being a winning poker in today's climate. But at the end of the day, live poker does come down to people and understanding what's going on with people. And here, you somehow cracked the code. Like I said, you were sitting there, I wasn't. You somehow said there's a non-zero chance that it's an angle. I'm going to hang on with ace-king. And then, of course, once you've done that on the flop, I think it's a pretty trivial call on the turn. And uh, I was in the nine, and he was in the one. So no, after the really, hand, yeah. so after the hand, some people were saying that they people closer to him who were looking, who could look at his eyes, were saying that it was obvious that he was making a mistake. Oh, but because you didn't really have a good angle, you yeah. Know, if you're in the nine seat, there's the dealer in between yeah, you, yeah. and you don't really have a good look at your opponent's face. I hate the nine and one for that exact reason. Any other seat, I can see everybody. I hate sitting in those seats. It's just ah. Um, Wow. But also, I feel like people are so results-oriented with that live. Like, especially if they're not in the hand. They don't have that much at stake, so why not just say they knew what was going to happen? I knew. I saw it in his eyes. Yeah, right. Yeah. Was, that, you got to take that with a grain of salt, too, right? <laughs> it's like it's like obvious they had aces there, you yeah, know? Yeah. So how much, um, how much stock do you put in your ability to read people's body language and uh, use your intuition in spots where the math is close? Um... Intuition. I, I think I'm thinking more when I I think more about like stra- strategic intuition. Like I think this person's gonna three bet more than they should and give up to four bets, or they're opening wider than they should or tighter than they should. I think like, that's kind of where my intuition is coming into play. So you don't really spend a lot of your brain energy trying to like read people's body language and breathing and whether they look uncomfortable and and some of the like live tells that people talk about. You don't really. Uh, focus on that as much as more just what's going on in their minds like strategically yeah I think once I get into the hand there's so much to think about it depends though like if obviously a a more amateur player I feel that they're potentially giving more away but yeah I feel like I look more for like timing and um, you know their mood based on like hands that they've lost or won recently those are kind of things that I'm usually looking for oh so that's interesting that you would pay more attention to recent results for like if a player has lost three pots in a row that might affect player x in these certain ways and player 
why in these other ways, right? So yeah, I noticed that too, like kind of game flow will affect people's strategy. Like if I've got caught bluffing three times in the last 15 minutes, I might be less likely to bluff again in the next 15 minutes where somebody else might be even more likely because they'll say, well, he knows that I've been caught, so I can't be bluffing this time. Yeah, exactly. So therefore I am. And like just kind of like crack the code of all of that, along with the hundreds of other things that you're thinking about while you're playing, uh, kind of makes this game unsolvable. Exactly, exactly. That's what's so beautiful about the game, that there is so much to pay attention to, and that's why I feel like preparation is always so helpful because it gives you like a few things left to think about. If you kind of know... The, uh, the ranges that your opponents might show up with, not even just like GTO ones, but like different typical ones that people might play. So you can focus more on body language or game flow. So that's why I really don't think that theory is at odds with uh, exploitative play. No, they work in concert. Yeah, exactly. They do. They must. I mean, in order to really get great at this game, as we're all still trying to do, obviously... I think you need to figure out how these things work together, not separate them. Like, you're either GTO or you're exploitable or exploitative. I, I don't believe that you can separate the two. That It shouldn't be... Uh, in poker, there seems to be a conversation right now. Like, well, do you play like a robot or do you play like in flow or something? And I think that understanding the theory is, as I said before, absolutely essential to have any success at all in the game. If you haven't done your homework on the theory, you don't know your, you know, 10 big blind shoving ranges, like all that kind of like stuff that you can actually do with a computer irrefutably solved, right? Then you also have to uh, learn about what affects people's interest in deviating from what the computers are telling us to do and why they do that. You know, you already mentioned one. Look how many people survive day one. Because even though the computer says you should do A, B, and C, they want to make day two. So instead they do B, but not A and C. Instead they do D, E, and F. And when you look at it that way, it's like you got to figure out what, I use quotation marks, mistakes players are making and figure out how to deviate from the technically, theoretically correct strategy because we're not playing in theory. We're playing in practice. But unless you have that solid foundation, you don't know where you're flying to and you're just like, in the plane <laughs> with a blindfold on and you're trying to get somewhere and good luck. Not with the way people play today. Like the game has changed. Years ago, you could have easily had a lot of success just kind of being a, what do they call it? A feel player, right? But now all the good players are using math. Yeah, it's, it's pretty fascinating, the direction and how, how difficult poker still is even with all these wonderful tools that we have. Yeah, and we talk about rec players and amateur players, but even they are competent. I mean, look at this rec player that you were up against in this hand. He made a big mistake by accidentally putting in 35 and then had the presence of mind to still make a pretty good play on the turn. Yeah, I mean, there's also a, definitely an argument for him just checking back and hoping to hit a jack in the river or something, you know? I mean... <laughs> no, I, I, yeah. like, I agree with you, Jen. I like his play. Once he makes that huge mistake of overbetting by mistake, I think that uh, following it up with like, look, she thinks I angled her. Mm -hmm. It looks like I angled her. I'm going to continue to look like I angled her. And I wanted to fold the flop. So, I, of course, I wasn't there. But, you know, the fact that he said oops would have really tricked me. So, to all the listeners, if you're ever at my table and you <laughs> want to trick me into folding a hand as strong as ace-king on king-5-5, five five, just overbet the pot and pretend it was a mistake and I'll just run for the hills. No problem. <laughs> I don't know if they'll take the advice but it would work against me didn't work against you though and was that the hand that gave you most of your chips um well i was up to like yeah i was up to i don't know like 230 at that point and then i won a few other nice pots and got all the way up to two, 250 270 and we won't talk about what happened yeah next. <laughs> a series of unfortunate events yeah a series of unfortunate events well i know that you can't stay any longer it's been such a quick uh and enjoyable conversation where else can people uh find you and what are you up to now you can find me at twitter at jen chahadi as well as instagram and of course you can find my podcast the grid on apple as well as stitcher and google podcast jen it is always such a pleasure uh, one of my favorite things about the world series of poker is that i actually get to see my friends in person and not just on social media and uh you know i wish you nothing but the best and uh thank you for being on the show today thank you clayton
So there you have it. I hope that you all enjoyed my exclusive interview with Jennifer Shahadi as much as I enjoyed speaking with her. Um, lots of more content from the World Series of Poker in the coming weeks. Thank you guys for being a part of it. Please do rate and review the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Podbean, and wherever else you may find your podcast entertainment. For everyone here at Tournament Poker Edge, I'm Clayton Fletcher. Thank you so much for listening. She can't read.